my name is Jeremy Malcolm. I'm from Electronic Frontier Foundation, and um, I have been involved with the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, and uh, now moving into the uh, TTIP, the um, Transatlantic Trade and Economic and uh, Investment Partnership. So I'm going to draw some parallels, talk about some of the differences and some of the lessons that we've learned from the TPP. Um, and I'm going to start by giving some background, talking a little bit about the substance of both agreements and then the process of negotiation, and particularly civil society's interaction with that process. And then I'll be drawing out some recommendations on uh, what I think has gone wrong and uh, how we can do it better. And um, I'm not going to take all my 15 minutes. So it should be done uh, and leave time for questions at the end. So uh, beginning with the background. So um, how is it that IP is even in trade agreements to begin with? Um, that's a question that I often grapple with because really um, IP is in some ways the opposite of the kind of things that are being done in trade agreements to reduce barriers because IP actually raises barriers in a lot of ways. It was a real coup for um, industry when IP was first added to the uh, WTO system in 1994 with the TRIPS agreement. And the theory was that countries that don't have IP um, protection uh, at the same level as other countries are raising an unfair trade barrier, which is a bit of a, a convoluted uh, set of reasoning, but that's uh, the rationale that was given at the time. Um, but as I said, IP itself is often a trade barrier. And, and this goes across all types of IP, and I've given some examples here. I guess the first one is one of the most obvious, where we had the, the patent wars between Apple and Samsung, and that actually disrupted trade in digital products between those two, two countries. So, so how is that uh, a free trade um, incentive? It's actually the opposite. Um, trademarks, well, I'm an Australian, as you can probably tell from my accent, and, and we lay claim to the uh, use of the word UGG for sheepskin boots, but so does an American company. So this led to a trade dispute between the USA and Australia over the, the humble UGG boot. Geographical indicators, another obvious one, you can't sell champagne or cognac anymore because those are protected by geographical indicators, so they have to come from, uh, from France. <laughs> um, and, and then copyright, so there are many examples I could have given for copyright. Um, the, the trade in books uh, between the UK and America was disrupted for many years um, because of differential treatment of copyright. Um, and this was before the USA entered into the Berne Convention. So for a, for a long time, books were being printed in the UK with a, with a note that said, not for import into the USA. And another example is this iconic image of Albert Einstein um, is out of copyright in Canada, and it's used freely on a range of materials, none of which can be imported into the United States because it's still in copyright there. So, uh, as you can see, I mean, it's really strange in, in a lot of ways that IP is treated as a trade, um, as a free trade issue when it's actually often the opposite. Um, so, I'm going to go and look a little bit about the status quo of IP in the TPP and then in the TTIP. Uh, none of this is official because these agreements are both secret and we don't know um, what has been agreed and what hasn't been agreed. There are rumours, so this is on the basis of leaked information and, uh, and what we've gathered from sporadic news reports and so on. Um, but as they say, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So if I've said here that um, you know, there's no problem anymore with um, parallel importation, I could be proved completely wrong when the agreement finally comes through because uh, who knows what kind of horse trading is going to go on at the last minute. So what we believe is that um, the negotiators have pretty much settled on the fact that there's going to be anti-circumvention rules in the TPP, which are going to be akin to those in the WIPO Copyright Treaty. Um, we believe that there will be actor-like IP enforcement provisions that all countries have basically already agreed to. Um, we figure that there's going to be a restatement of the three-step test which requires any uh, limitations and exceptions to copyright to comply with that test. Um, so that's likely to end up in the final agreement if there is a final agreement. On the other hand, uh, we may be safe from limitations on parallel importation of copyright goods. Um, there may not be a prohibition on uh, pre-grant patent opposition as had been formally proposed. And there may not be 
uh, copyright protection for temporary copies uh, as we had earlier feared. Um, but then there are some other issues that we have reason to think are still very much live and these include whether or not the copyright term will be extended by 20, uh, 20 years uh, for countries that don't already have that, um, whether the TPP will mandate notice and takedown uh, or whether there will be more flexibility to allow other systems of intermediary liability such as notice and notice, um, judicial uh, take down and, and so on. And uh, finally, big dispute over investor state dispute settlement. So that's a rough idea which is n in no way canonical of the status quo of the negotiations on IP and the TPP. Plus there are all these other issues that are sort of tangential to IP but which are also very important to us and which have a bearing on IP um, enforcement such as um, the transparency of the agreement itself. Um, Issues of local content quotas, um, which uh, are seen as a trade barrier, like if you if you require a certain amount of local content um, on TV or uh, film, uh, regulatory coherence. I won't go into, but that's another whole kettle of fish. And ISDS. So, um, what about the TTIP? Well, we know a lot less because it's at a far earlier stage. Um, we've heard that geographical indicators are going to be one of the issues that um, should be treated in there. Um, patentability, standards, and trade secrets, as we've just heard, that was very useful um, to, to hear about trade secrets and how that could be a new sort of unexplored threat um, for the public interest in IP. Um, we're told, but we can't place much weight in this, that IP enforcement won't be included because of the bad experience with ACTA that uh, um, Sean referred to and likewise intermediary liability, which is a sort of part of the enforcement regime, and data protection because it's so um, controversial may not be included, but who knows. Um, and uh, beyond that, there's a real question mark, like are they going to try and put the copyright term in there? There's not much point because US and, and Europe already have the same copyright term, but maybe they'll try and put that in there just um, to draw a line in the sand for other countries in the future. Um, protection of seeds, uh, protection of trademarks, who knows. Um, but a lot of those same overall cross-cutting issues are relevant in the TTIP as well as the TPP. The transparency of the agreement, the regulatory coherence which is coming back in as well, um, that was a new chapter for the TPP um, which hadn't been seen in previous trade agreements designed to sort of streamline the process by which regulations are made, and ISDS. So um, that's an overview of the substance. Um, what about the process? As I've sort of indicated, transparency is exactly the same problem across both agreements. Um, the TPP has been notorious for this, and the TIP is making the same mistakes, uh, and indeed the same mistakes that were made with ACTA. Um, so there's no release of negotiating texts, at least as Sean said with ACTA, we did have a negotiating text uh, released. Um, we, we haven't had any official releases with the TPP. Um, the release of background materials to, to give the substance of the negotiations has been very sporadic, They're really just left to individual countries. If they choose to release some information, they can, but there's been nothing coordinated, there's been no central, real, useful information. There are lots of press releases which tell us absolutely nothing, but in terms of the substance of the agreement, very little, very little indeed. Um, likewise, face-to-face -face briefings, have been given by some countries, not by others. And um, some countries do allow cleared advisors to have access to the text, but only under a non-disclosure agreement, which means that it's not possible to consult widely um, with the public. And the reason it's often given for this is that, well, this is the way it's always been done in trade. Um, we, and, and there's no other way to do it. It couldn't be possible to negotiate an agreement if you had to disclose your position. Um, but that's patently false because there are other institutions where that does happen routinely. Um, WIPO releases negotiating texts and civil society observers are allowed in the room while the negotiations are going on. Um, and even in a trade context, this has been tried before um, with the Free Trade Area of the Americas uh, negotiation which was released as a draft um, before it was, well in, in, in the end it wasn't concluded. but. Uh, um, but still, I mean, the practice uh, is not without precedent, so um, that's certainly what we are calling for. Um, and alongside transparency goes the issue of participation. So transparency is about just knowing what, what 
positions are being negotiated, and then participation is being able to have um, some input into that process. So um, there's little to none in uh, in either TPP or TTIP. Um, there's no observers allowed to attend the negotiations. Until last year, the TPP negotiations did have open space during the negotiation rounds in or near the venue uh, where you could make presentations to negotiators uh, and then interact with them uh, informally during receptions and papering events. Um, those have been cancelled. There's been no more of those. Um, no real reason. Um, officially, the negotiation rounds are over, yet they continue. And so the fiction is that because we've finished negotiating now, we no longer have to have these public consultations. Except that they are still negotiating, and it's just a lie to say that anything has changed, um, except for the exclusion of civil society. So uh, we're trying to still uh, have some input. We're trying to organise a side meeting uh, for the next negotiation round, which we were told was in Vancouver, but which subsequently leaked out that it was Ottawa. Um, and they're not even going to tell us where they're going to hold the event. So we don't even know where to book our hotels. We don't know where to book this meeting. It is an absolute farce. Um, and and it's, it runs completely counter to emerging global norms which require that on issues that affect the uh, internet users, um, there should be broad multi-stakeholder participation. Only last month, uh, the Net Mundial multi-stakeholder statement uh, was released in Sao Paulo, um, saying that internet governance should be built on democratic multi-stakeholder processes, ensuring the meaningful and account accountable participation of all stakeholders. European and American governments participated in the development of this statement and yet they do not live up to their fine words. So what can we do to fix this? Um, firstly, do we want IP in TTIP at all? I don't think we do, but if we do, I mean, if it's inevitable that it's going to be included, how can we include it in a way that makes sense in the context of free trade? Well, um, there's some simple text that we could include that wouldn't do any harm. So, you know, the parties affirm their existing rights and obligations, nothing should derogate from existing obligations. Parties recognise the need to achieve a balance between the rights of right holders and the legitimate interests of, the u of users and the community with regard to protected subject matter. Um, the parties may establish limitations and exceptions in the domestic laws as acceptable under the Berne Convention, TRIPS, the WCT and the WPPT. Now, have I just pulled this language out of my whatever? No, I haven't. This language actually comes from a former TPP. The TPP in a former incarnation called the P4 or the TPCEP, the Trans-Pacific Strategic Economic Partnership. That language was included. They've, uh, that actually was concluded between four countries that are a subset of the TPP negotiating countries, Singapore, New Zealand, Chile, and Brunei. It remains in force. Um, it's not even superseded by the TPP, um, and it was also quite a broad uh, 21st century agreement. Um, but when the United States and other countries decided they wanted in, that language was yanked out. Um, so my submission is that if the TTIP is going to include IP at all, then the P4 does provide a much better, more balanced model of how to do it. Um, as for the process, certainly stakeholders should have ongoing access to the text um, without non-disclosure obligations. It's just basic democracy. I mean, that is, you can't get much simpler than that. Um, parties to the negotiation should publish the draft text before any final agreement is signed and with sufficient time to enable effective legislative scrutiny in public debate. Again, this language, I didn't just come up with that. There were a bunch of legislators from around the world, from all of the TPP negotiating countries, that have made a statement to this effect. And you can see that at www.tppmpsfortransparency.org. The venue of the negotiating rounds should be released to the public at the same time as they're released to, to negotiators. That just seems like common sense. Um, and the negotiation rounds should again include accessible, open public engagement events. This should apply to the t future TPP rounds as well as the TTIP. So, in summary, IP is often as often a trade barrier as a trade enabler. Um, if we're going to include IP in trade agreements, we should simply affirm the existing international obligations that have been developed in specialised bodies like WIPO. And we should emphasise the flexibilities that actually support free trade. 
rather than the barriers that inhibit free trade. Um, as trade agreements are moving away from tariff negotiation, I mean, that's really just a minor part of trade agreements now, uh, it's no longer as appropriate as it may arguably have been in the past to do this in secret. Um, these are public issues of broad importance, um, such as IP, along with other issues such as environmental and, and, and all sorts of financial services, consumer protection. All of these things require the release and the active dissemination of text and briefing papers. And we need to have broad public, pu public participation in the negotiation rounds, including the ability to observe and comment. Otherwise, um, I feel uh, that the process shortcomings that are common to the TPP and the TTIP may be the undoing of both. Thank you very much.